Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of the Talking Sira podcast. I pray that everyone is well and in good health. Um, but firstly, I'd like to apologize for the long delay uh, since our last episode. I think it's been a couple of months really. And, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in with, with coronavirus and the lockdown just has made it difficult for, for myself and the production team at Votu to come together and uh, produce the episodes and release the episodes. So... The series really came to a bit of a standstill. Um, however, alhamdulillah, we're, we're back now, and we want to start releasing uh, these, ser- you know, these episodes a bit more frequently and more regularly, and consistently, inshallah. Um, but one thing that we will change um, is that we will make this podcast an audio-only podcast. Um, knowing that, you know, I've had quite a few messages from people asking when, you know, when we'd be reconvening the series and. It's been a while, and you know, and it's it's understandable. It's it's been it's, it has been quite a few weeks, um, but but in fact, most of most of the audience do listen on the podcast series rather than the video. So we've decided as a team to to stop doing the video and and just focus on audio only. Inshallah, it's just it's just myself really doing these series. So inshallah, it doesn't cause too much disruption, and um, really, hopefully, the, the benefit is that the production time will be reduced. So. It means that we will be able to release episodes a bit more frequently and, and consistently, like I said. So inshallah, in today's episode, um, with it being such a while since our last episode, it would be good to give a bit of a recap um, of what we've kind of discussed thus far in the, in the first seven episodes. And move. I wanted to today kind of focus on something that is d- absolutely linked to the Sira, but not the actual events. So um, I want to focus on the message that the Messenger والسلام, had brought mankind, meaning the Qur'an, and how the Qur'an really was his proof of messengership and prophethood, um, and why we as Muslims really need to understand this and, and do a bit more research and, and, and make sure that we um, can grasp this, so that it makes us stronger believers, but also allow us to um, tackle any arguments that we find, uh, you know, increasingly in, in the day and age that we live today, where um, you know the, the alien thoughts, uh, thoughts that are f- far from the deen, are, are becoming a bit more predominant. It's important that all of us um, understand our deen and understand why we we know with the yakin why Islam is the true, um, true, re- not just religion but true deen, true way of life. So, inshallah, um, let's just give a bit of a recap of what we've discussed thus far in the first uh, seven episodes. So, um, if you cast your minds back a little bit, in the first few episodes we spoke about uh, the importance of understanding and, and really reflecting upon the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Especially in today's day and age where there is uh, this attempt to move us away from understanding the life of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in the correct manner. So we spoke about this, gave quite a few reasons why it was important. We also spoke about in, in some of the early episodes uh, about the situation of pre-Islamic Arabia and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen this land, this people, uh, for the message of Islam in the first place. Um, we, we spoke about the significant events before the messenger's birth and, and, and his actual birth and, and what, why it signified something important, something significant was about to occur in the life of um, our our beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In episode four and five, we moved on to speaking about the first ayat. So when the revelation of Islam descended upon the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you know the early ayat, how it really signified the importance of knowledge and action, and and something that we can reflect on today and 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 you know embrace and bring into our lives. We also spoke about the the beginning of the mission mission of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the overall stages of the messengers that were, um, and and the, and why it's important, and really um, why the sira. And going back to some of the first uh, lessons we, we we spoke about, why understanding the practical steps of Islam and and the messengers' life will allow us to implement Islam today. And going on to kind of last the the previous episode and the episode before that, we spoke about how the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam really targeted certain people um, in the early stages knowing 
who would be the most receptive to Islam and um, and he he built this core group of Sahaba, this core um, kind of his his, his supporters, his his uh, companions, who would understand Islam in the purest sense. But also, they were the ones that were strongest in Islam, not just from a understanding perspective, but also they were ready to face the hostility. They were ready to face the animosity that they they'd inevitably face um, when they would go out into society. And in the last episode, we we'd moved on to this. We spoke about how. Uh, the messenger went out into society with his new group and informed uh, you know the people what islam was and what islam came to do and how it came to challenge the status quo um, and how the, you know really by and large the Quraysh rejected uh, the message of islam and we went into quite a few of the reasons uh, whether it be kind of jealousy and envy or fear of losing wealth or fear of change and and, and the change from the status quo for example um so, you know, this led to the Quraysh attempting to disrupt the Dawah, disrupt uh, the way the Messenger Sallallahu was going about his mission. Um, and, and just moving on to kind of today's episode, really, we also spoke about how the Quraysh wanted to unify, unify their position against the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they would, you know, they wanted to tell people when they were coming for Hajj, for example, many people would come around, all around Arabia to, for Hajj. And they wanted to unify their stance against uh, the messenger, um, and and they, and they struggled really. They they couldn't really call him a liar. They couldn't call him a madman. They couldn't, um, you know, it was pure slander. And they knew that this wouldn't really uh, fit. But they they had to come to a uni- unified position to have a little bit of credibility. So one of the things we also spoke about how is how they, any time the Quran was mentioned, they would do their best to kind of you know close their ears off and, and tell people to avoid listening and we gave quite a few examples in the last episode so bringing ourselves onto today's episode you know what was it about the quran that made it miraculous what what made it um, a proof of the messengers uh, of the muhammad sallallahu messengership and how does it confirm for us today that this is really the speech of allah and the true deen you know islam is the true deen and 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 effectively, how we would be able to defend Islam if it ever came to you know when we were challenged, and when when we're speaking to our children and our the next generation, we're able to explain Islam in in the pure sense. So it's not just kind of passed down as a as a culture, but rather it's passed down as a, a clear understanding of why Islam is the true religion and that the Quran is the word and speech of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So before we kind of go into that, um, it's really important to ask ourselves first, why is it important for us to understand? Like I've just talk, spoken about, why is it important for us to understand the miraculous nature of the Qur'an? Uh, the, the first point really to understand is that as Muslims, you know, as those who love Allah, as those who love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we, um, you know, we're, being a Muslim is about submission. And that's why we need to have that complete submission and yaqeen, that concrete, decisive belief that the Qur'an is the word of Allah, right? And, you know, this forms a core part of our aqidah, um, our belief system, our creed. So we shouldn't just kind of accept uh, the Qur'an as, 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 you know, the book of Islam and that's it. We should be able to understand um, what makes it the, you know, the word of Allah, the speech of Allah, and you know we're all Muslims. Alhamdulillah, you know we would do profess uh, the Shahada, but we have to also ask ourselves how many of us could articulate ourselves why Islam is the truth, and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is indeed the messenger of Allah, and you know we don't really. Sometimes it might be quite difficult to ask this question because it feels a bit like you know we should just accept it, and that's not true. You know we should be able to rationally come to the position. Uh, confidently that Islam is the truth and that's why it's important that we we're able to, to ourselves understand this and inshallah you even able to articulate it it doesn't always need to be so complex either you know simply uh, simplistically articulate why uh, Islam is the true deen and as, I, as I'm saying you know in this day and age it becomes even more important um, you know we speak about all these you know things that our children are teach are being taught but one of the biggest challenges I think that not just the youth but even ourselves face is that 
atheism is being heavily promoted. It, we live in a very atheistic, godless society. So um, with this being dominated, whether it be in the media, in our schools, across society, we'll find that the challenge against Islam, the true deen, is, you know, there'll be more of that. And that's why we have to ensure that we're able to confidently defend Islam. And not just for us, but our children as well. Uh, you know, they're the ones that are going to be facing this onslaught on Islam and religion. So we ourselves must, um, you know, must be able to, whilst they're quite young, try to, you know, make them understand. And, and, and the first place to start is understanding ourselves. So, you know, in Islam, our belief of Islam is very much different to the Christians and the Jews and any other religion, really. You know, all the followers of other religions, they um, they have this belief based on faith. And faith um, is not the same as what belief or, or iman, you know, what we call in Islam, iman. We wouldn't translate iman as faith because faith has this, you know, it denotes a sense of doubt. It denotes this kind of feeling and emotion as opposed to this concrete belief and confidence and firm conviction in Islam and it's, that's what Islam is and this is how we should embrace Islam not just a faith or something that we hope in however something that we know to be true and we know with conviction to be true and we have this kind of unwavering belief um, in Islam so you know we, we must have this absolute yakin in Islam and, and have no doubt and in order to do this we, we, we can prove this right we, we have a proof and inshallah today I can give a little bit you know there's more lectures and more other things we can listen to and read but inshallah I can give some of the foundations of, of how we do this um, and and this just kind of goes back to the seerah um, in what we spoke about in the last episode is having this yakin and this confidence and this strength in Islam and knowing that Islam is the truth really gave uh, the strength to the sahaba and it allowed them to understand why they were here. They, they knowing this, it, it gave them a new lease of life, and they were able to go in society without having any fear of what happens to them, because their fear was just for Allah, and their their objective was only to please Allah. And if we want to have the same trait and mentality, we must also go through that same process. And inshallah, that's you know, to intend to do that today and through the series, provide some of that. So that either you know gives you a bit of a stepping stone to learn more and gain a bit more knowledge, but also um, you know something that we can speak about simplistically and not have to go into all the thick of uh, the seerah and every single step, but but speak about it in a practical manner, something that we can bring in our lives today. So the proof of Islam being the truth really is in the miraculous Quran, the Ijaz al Quran as we call it in uh, in Arabic. So to to do that, like I've, like I've said, you know, as Muslims, we need to be able to articulate how the Quran is miraculous, not just to ourselves but to others as well. So, just to kind of before we set that out, the framework really is, as uh, we all know, you know, anyone who comes and claims to be a messenger or claims to be a prophet has to prove that claim. It's easy for anyone to say it and make that proclamation. But the, the natural question really becomes, how can you prove it? You know, it can't be taken lightly. Someone just calling out they're a messenger. No one's just going to accept it just like that. You know, you have to prove that. It's a, it's a big statement to make. Likewise, all the prophets and the messengers did this. They, they proved their claim. And, you know, even though the messenger, our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was known to be the most trustworthy and the most, the most truthful. We spoke about it last time where... We spoke about the event of, um, you know, when he went up the Mount Safa and he uh, he said, you know, to the people that, would you believe me if there's an army behind me? And the Quraysh said, you know, you are Sadiq al -Amin. you are the truthful and the trustworthy. You've never known to lie, so of course we'd believe you. Yet, when he told them that, you know, he comes to warn them and he comes with the message of Islam, many of them still rejected. So... What this means is that it's not just within our character itself and whether we have, you know, whether we are truthful, as Muslims we should be truthful, this in itself will not uh, prove to people that Islam is the truth. It's, it needs a bit more than that. And, you know, um, when when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to society, he was quite blunt. He, he had this trait where he just said, he didn't mince his words, he would say it as it is. 
So you know when he was questioning the Quraysh and he was he was questioning the practices whether it be kind of the cheat for, when they were cheating in the marketplace or when they were burying their daughters alive, he would challenge this. So you know the Quraysh had every right to ask who is this person, who is this man that is coming to challenge our norms and challenge our idolatry and paganism. Who is he? And it's they have every right to ask this question and you know and and ask for some proof and evidence of why he is truly the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so like i said anyone who prove, who claims to be a messenger he must prove that claim and that that proof must be beyond doubt it must be you know total uh, robust watertight proof and one of the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done is that whenever the messengers would prove their messengership um, it would come you know so there'll be a miracle to prove that but it would also come with a challenge for the people to either replicate or match and um, you know that greatest proof of messengership is a miracle but what is a miracle when we say a miracle what do we really mean um, a miracle really is something that is beyond the capabilities uh, capability of human beings and it goes against kind of universal nature. Uh, what what we will find in reality, it goes against that. And that is uh, what we really, in the, in the strictest sense, we we define as a miracle. However, today, you know, you you see that the word is used quite unashamedly and kind of incorrectly, really, to describe other things that aren't really miracles. So, you know, they will talk about a miraculous goal, for example, when someone scores a, a good goal, or they talk about like a miraculous recovery if someone's, um, you know, made a recovery from from a really bad situation. However, in reality, although there may be, you know, amazing event in that sense, if you want to call it that, they're not really miraculous because they don't go against the nature. They don't go against um human what humans are capable of doing they don't really de defy universal nature so a true miracle or in islam mu'jiza is something that man is unable to do you know unless they have the permission of allah and allah allah allows them to change or do something by his will so you know obviously we know that allah is the controller of 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 the the laws he's the controller of nature so it's only through allah that miracles can occur so all of Allah's messengers, uh, they came with miracles to prove their claim. And they also set a challenge for people to match. So that if anyone was challenging the messengers, they could, you know, they could prove it through matching the miracle or beating the miracle, uh, you know, and, and, and show that the messenger, whoever is claiming it, to be false. But obviously we know this didn't happen because the people weren't able to match it. Um, you know, the... Hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that when he would send prophets or messengers uh, with a miracle He would make sure that the miracle was something that the people were the best judges of So it was something that they were experts at, the people And what's amazing about that is that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know Obviously, he, you know, Allah is all-knowing and he knows that if he sends a messenger with this proof, it will have the biggest impact because the people were the best judges of it. And if the, the messenger does something beyond their capability in a, in a field that they are experts in, it would have the biggest impact in followership and people knowing that the messengers were indeed messengers of Allah. So for instance, uh, Musa alayhi salam, he, you know, he came at a time when the people were at the heights of magic and sorcery and il illusions. So they were the experts in this field. So much so that, you know, even Fir'aun, uh, the, the tyrant, the, the leader of the time, he knew the influence of magic. So he had his own magicians um, who would, you know, be in submission to him and aided his cause. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of really, everyone knows the story, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he decreed a mu'jiza upon Musa alayhi salam. And you know he allowed uh, Musa alayhi salam to challenge these magicians with something much greater than their illusions and their magic, if you want to call it that. Um, so on one occasion, you know, in the courtyard of Fir'aun, uh, the magicians and Musa alayhi salam 
came together. You know, Firaun set an appointment for his magicians and Musa alayhi salam to come together in an appointment in front of the people uh, to prove their claims and, and Musa alayhi salam to prove his claim. So, you know, the magicians, they uh, they started with their magic and they kind of shown, they, they showed their the snakes, uh, which were just a mere illusions to the people and they were just, it's just pure trickery um, of, 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 the, of the eye. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then told Musa alayhi salam to throw down his staff. And with the will of Allah, this staff actually became a real snake. And it consumed the, the illusions of the magicians. And on that, the sorcerers themselves, subhanAllah, because they were the experts, they knew um, what they were doing was mere illusions. And when they saw the real snake of Musa alayhi salam had consumed their illusions, they fell down in submission to the Lord of Musa alayhi salam, as we, as we know in the Qur'an. So, you know, th- they said, you know, we believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. And, you know, this obviously angered Firaun and, you know, he, he, he became angry because the people were watching and the people saw in front of, uh, in the eyes of Firaun and the eyes of everyone, that Musa alayhi salam was indeed on the truth and he was, you know, he proved his messengership through that. You know, this wasn't, as I was saying, this isn't just a, a, a miracle and a miracle, a miraculous event, even though it was that. It was also a challenge. It was a challenge to Firaun and to all the sorcerers, his sorcerers, everyone, to produce something of its like. You know, to produce the same kind of uh, miracle that Musa salam, had done. Um, and if they were unable to do that, to concede that Musa alayhi salam was indeed the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, the fact that these magicians that submitted, you know, they were the best experts in, in this field, they had no choice. And that is why they submitted. And, you know, that would have had a massive impact on the people knowing that the best of the best, those magicians who were with Fir'aun themselves submitted to Musa alayhi salam. A similar case can be said for Isa alayhi salam who came at a time, what was the kind of social currency then? What was the, the main uh, thing that the people were experts at? It was medicine, you know, and cures. So this um, was so so important that, you know, the religious clergy at the time, they had great influence when they were able to heal. So they, you know, they would, um, you know, work immensely to have this ability to cure and to heal because they knew that it gave them more influence amongst the people. So what happened in the life of Isa alayhi salam is that he did something beyond medicine, beyond just curing. And he it was beyond human capability by the will of Allah. For example, he cured someone who was, you know, people who were blind from birth. He cured, he cured them and gave them back their sight through the will of Allah. He cured the leper from leprosy. Um, and this was something that was unheard of then. And subhanAllah, he even brought the dead back to life with the will of, will of Allah. So when the people saw this, they they had to attest that Isa alayhi salam was actually the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, like, like with Musa, Isa alayhi salam's uh, miracle was a challenge to the people to produce something like it. You know, you guys are the experts. You guys are the ones that are producing medicine and cures. If you're able to do something like what Isa alayhi salam has done, do it, you know, that's the challenge. And if you're not able to do that, then accept that Isa alayhi salam is indeed the messenger of Allah. So again, this, you know, this was the challenge and this proved uh, the messengership of, of these uh, prophets. The, the same can be said for uh, Salih alayhi salam. You know, he came to the people where the people would create their abodes and houses from rock and they were really strong people. And you know, they, they would have that pride in that they could create their houses from these mountains of rock. And what was the miracle of Salih salam, alayhi salam? Actually, in fact, the miracle was something that the people asked for, as we find in the Quran, that they asked um, uh, the Salih alayhi salam to produce a she camel from the mountains. And he did do that. He made dua to Allah and, you know, Allah granted him a huge she camel that came from the mountains. And, you know, the people the, the people that were sincere uh, believed in his message when they saw this. But there'll always be people that don't believe. And that's something, another lesson we can take from this is that, 
despite miracles happening before the eyes of people, despite people knowing the miracles of these prophets, they still disbelieved because of their pride and their ego. And we find the same case with Islam, and as we'll go through the miracle um, shortly now. So, you know, this is what it means, what a mu'jiza really means, and what, what was bestowed on the prophets to prove their messengership. Um, just on a side note, um, you know, this is a miracle for proof of messengership. There were other cases where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, made a miracle occur upon a, a person. For example, Maryam alayhi salam. Um, you know, the, the fact that she was bir- um, gave birth when she was a virgin, um, that was a miracle, that was a karama. But, um, you know, this didn't make her a prophet, for example. You know, we wouldn't say this because Allah just subhanahu wa ta'ala just through his will, he um, he bestowed a miracle upon her and other miracles that occurred upon people. And it didn't come with a challenge. It wasn't a challenge for her not to do this. So just to make that distinction between the two. So let's move on to the Messenger Wasallam's miracle. What, what did he come with? And before moving on to, the, you know, before speaking about that, what was it that had the greatest influence in Arab society? What did they excel at? You know, what was their... Um, expertise and mo- any most historians attest to this and most know that the Arabs of that society and the Arabian Peninsula one thing that they were the experts in was the command of the Arabic language you know they treated the Arabic language and poetry and uh, just kind of um, the eloquent speech they gave that great regard um, and it had the greatest impact and influence in Meccan society and Arab society at large. So, you know, it wasn't just like a hobby or a pastime. It was influential. You know, poetry was so influential that it was able to start and end wars. It was able to kind of strengthen or destroy the reputation of a tribe or a people. And, you know, it was very similar, if you want to make a comparison to the mainstream media today. It, it held that weight to kind of influence society and create propaganda against people and, and, and um, like I said, cause wars. So just to give a bit of a flavour of what they used to do, they'd have competitions in the marketplace where Arabs from far and wide would attend, uh, you know, the, the in, in Mecca as well, near the Kaaba, they would attend and have like poetry battles, if you want to call it, um, to listen and people would come to listen to this literary art um, because of its influence, because of, of, of the high status they gave to this. And, you know, subhanAllah, even the best pieces of poetry would be hung up in the Kaaba itself. Uh, Al-Mu'allaqat uh, is something that, you know, that we know was there. It's the, the seven hung or suspended poems. This is what it means. And what would happen is that the seven best poems would be hung up inside the Kaaba and decorated and written in gold. And they gave, you know, just highlighting how they gave great regard to this. Because they not only were they, they were experts in this, but also they it, it influenced society, and it, it was given such a high status that you know it was placed in their most important place, which is the Kaaba. So this was the environment that the Arabs were in. So really, what it proves is that they were the best judge of speech and language. You know, they were the the experts in this field. So what was the miracle? that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon the messenger alayhi wa salatu wa salam it was the linguistic miracle of the Quran in that you know it went beyond the poetry and excellence of eloquence that the people knew and had said and had hung up in the Kaaba the Quran went beyond this and it was beyond the capability of humans and it, it created perfect speech that no one could match so how are we um, as Muslims able to appreciate the miracle and even non-Muslims? Um, it's by understanding the Arabic language and the Arabs amongst us, uh, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, um, can sense the miracle and the miraculous nature of the Qur'an in its language. So when they listen or read or hear the Qur'an, you know they are able to tell that this is beyond the capability, capability of human beings. However, as non-Arabs, uh, as myself, I don't, you know, I don't speak Arabic. How do we simply understand this miracle? So before kind of going into um, the many reasons and claims against, uh, you know, the Quran being a miracle, how do we appreciate it? 
Um, the reality is that language, uh, in, in simple terms, is split into two different forms. One is prose and the other is poetry. So prose is that free, natural speech uh, that many of us will write when we're writing a report or, or, or speak as well. And that's all about um, ensuring that we follow the rules of grammar and um, the focus is really on the meaning to get the, convey the correct meaning. Then you have poetry that doesn't really um, need to follow all the grammatical rules, but it's more about uh, following a metrical structure, something that sounds good. And, uh, and you know, it could be rhyme, it could be limerick, it could be sonnet, it could be different forms uh, to really uh, emphasize a certain, uh, you know, saying uh, and, and to get that poetry and rhythm across. So when poets uh, write their poems, they do focus more on following those metrical structures and, and, and having that sound uh, of, of poetry. That is their focus. So when they do this, they do compromise some of the meaning um, and they will also compromise the grammar and the grammatic rules. So, you know, it's not to say that the poems don't have meaning. They do. However, they, they compromise and it's a bit more flexible. So if this, if these are the two forms of language, and we can go into more, you know, there's much more that can be said about this, but if in simple terms, these are the four, two forms of language. Um, Quran, in fact, um, you know, takes all the traits of these, both of these uh, forms, and it, it, it's at the height of both uh, in terms of it perfects all the traits of language. So in the Quran, you know, the meaning is the perfect meaning in the best way it can be expressed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that in the Quran. So it's very clear and very concise in that meaning and all Arabs will attest to this. Um, the other thing is that the grammatic rules are not compromised. It continues to follow the best of grammatic uh, grammar and also the meaning is not compromised. The meaning is, is very clear as well and perfect. So what the Qur'an really does is brings all of these together um, and it, it, it sounds amazing as well. So it, it's sweeter than what we have in poems and it sounds much more elegant and more eloquent than poetry. So this is the miraculous nature of the Qur'an and even though we are not Arab, many of us are not Arab, um, it will be difficult to appreciate this. However, um, we can. We can still appreciate it from listening to other Arabs and even non-Arabs have many non-Arabs have, uh, can, you know, believe and also even if even though they don't believe in Islam, they do attest and, um, you know, claim that this Quran and word is the word of Allah and it's beyond uh, the capability of human human beings, even if they don't believe in Islam itself. So, just to kind of bring um, some of the other arguments that are brought forward against this claim. So, you know, as Muslims, we know that Islam is the truth, the Qur'an is the word of Allah, and it is beyond the capability of human beings, and, and is a miracle. There are other claims that are made uh, by those who, you know, hate Islam and those who want to try to disprove Islam. The first claim is that the Qur'an was from Muhammad sallallahu himself in that he wrote the Qur'an. This is their claim, that this Qur'an was just written by uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and uh, it's nothing more than his speech. And, you know, although it is perfect and a uh, very high level, it's still from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That's the first thing. The second uh, claim is that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was taught by someone else and was given... Um, you know, this speech by somebody else that was ex excelled in poetry, for example. These are the two claims that are made. Um, and then the third claim is obviously what we believe, that no, it didn't come from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He wasn't taught, but actually it was being revealed to him by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala through Jibreel Alayhi Salam. So let's take each of the claims by, you know, one by one. The first one, you know, that the Qur'an was from Muhammad Sallallahu So someone could claim that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was secretly learning in the first 40 years of his life um, and, and putting together the Qur'an. And then when he was ready, he, he kind of revealed it to the people and he, he was, you know, the claim is that he was a, a false prophet. So this... Um, this is the this is the accusation that some may make, um, but there's a few things that we can say that will go against this claim, right, or, or, or rebut this claim. 
So the first thing is that if Muhammad Sallallahu for example, according to their claim, was this great writer who had held it all back inside and, and pulled it together and and then you know revealed it after he was ready, we have to recognize that all great writers, the best of writers and the best in poetry, for example, they develop over time. So, um, you know, Shakespeare, for example, they he didn't all of a sudden become amazing at his uh, his works and his language, but it developed over time. And you know, he peaked at a stage, and then eventually he he actually even his his work became weaker. And this is a natural natural in any not just language in any um, profession or any expertise that we have. So, for example. You know, a footballer, for example, um, you know, they they start off at a young age learning the trade um, and becoming, you know, gaining experience in, in playing the sport, for example. And they, they peak at a certain age where they're playing their best football and their best best sport. And eventually they become, become a bit old and they lose some of their skills and, and they become weaker again and they retire. So this is kind of the natural course of any expertise, language or not. So to claim that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, bought it himself and he learned and he brought it, you would find that the Qur'an would be inconsistent and there would be some high bits, you know, very eloquent bits and some bits that are, are weaker. In fact, though, the Qur'an doesn't do this. It is con- consistent in its uh, high level of language and in its perfection, in that it's always at that stable level. Um, and there was never a time where some of the verses of the Quran were weaker and others were stronger. It was always at that level. So that really proves that it could not have come from Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is, you know, one argument against this claim. The other thing that we um, should know is that there is no, you know, traceability of the Quran with other similar writings. So to claim that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was some sort of genius in language but where did he learn from you know if especially because Muhammad sallam was known to be illiterate and you know unwritten so to you know he was the last person to be uh, an amazing secret uh, you know po- poet for example or someone who had excellent speech and you know the reality is that no one has ever matched the Quran and we will speak a bit about the challenge that came with the Quran um, that really proves beyond doubt that it was has not been met and is the speech of Allah. So this, um, you know, this is an, uh, another claim that is made. Um, and the final thing to point out to kind of rebut and put to bed this claim is that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, had other speech, you know, his own speech, in which we find in the uh, Hadith, um, that you know he had his own way of speaking and his own style of speaking. And when you put this with the Quran and the speech of Allah, it is clear to see the difference. You you can see the difference in that language. You know, one is the speech of a man in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the other is the speech of Allah, which is perfect. And you know, all Arabs will will tell you this that there is a clear difference between the two. And whenever um, you know, you know, he never had a slip of the tongue where Muhammad sallam would speak one way. And accidentally speak at a high level, for example, with his hadith. No, it was always at like hum- human level, uh, whereas the Quran was not. The Quran was on on another level and beyond this. So let's move on to the second claim. The second claim is that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was taught by somebody else, and you know this was a claim actually made by the Quraysh. They made this claim that the Messenger uh, learnt his speech from a Christian man called Jabir. Um, and you know, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, explains this in the Quran in which he says uh, we know indeed that they say it is a man that taught him Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the tongue of him they wickedly point to, point to is notably foreign so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you're talking about this Christian man Jabir but he is foreign, he's a non-Arab so and then Allah says while this i.e. the Quran is Arabic pure and clear so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is ridiculing the Quraysh for making this claim because even you know this man Christian man is not a non-Arab he's a, he has a foreign tongue so how could he come with something that is beyond the capabilities of these Arabs who were meant to be experts uh, in the field of, of language and the Arabic language so this even this claim is an insult to themselves 
um, that someone else could have taught Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you know this this is not not the case. So you know the Arabs who had heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam reciting as well uh, in the, in, the, in the Arab society and the Croatian society, they were also engrossed by its eloquence and splendor in terms of language. Um, and the the key example that um, really highlights this is that. The best of them in poetry and the best of them in language, Al Walid bin Mughera, he himself, even though he was an enemy of Islam and one of the leaders, um, he he was the best in poetry, as he says in a quote himself. Uh, and you know, this is this is found in in our traditions where Al Walid bin Mughera he said, "There is not a man amongst you who is more well versed in poetry than me, or has more knowledge of Arabic's poetic metre than me. I swear." In the saying that he says, there is a sweetness and beauty, and in it there is grace and elegance. At its highest, it is a fresh green and green and leafy, and at its lowest, it is copious and abundant with rain. Verily, it is the highest, and nothing is higher than it. So he himself, the one who is the best poet amongst them, you know, he is conceding that. Uh, the speech that's coming from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, i.e. the Quran, is uh, you know a high high status beyond the capability of man, and this was also um, you know believed by the the other leaders, even though they didn't want to attest to it and they didn't want to um, admit this because of their pride and ego. For example, we know all know the story of the three leaders, Abu Jahl, who was the Fir'aun of this Ummah, as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, he was he was the, the greatest enemy of Islam. He himself, along with Abu Sufyan and uh, Ahnas ibn Shuraik, each of them individually, one, you know, what they would do is try to listen to the Quran in secrecy, uh, you know, out of the way of the public. So on one night, for example, um, when the time of Fajr, Muhammad Sallallahu was reading the Quran out aloud in his house. And each of them, individually not knowing, would come out into the darkness of the streets and near the house of the, the Messenger وسلم, and listen to the Quranic speech. And all the way up until dawn when the sun would rise, and when, when, when they were leaving, they bumped into each other and they saw that you know, they all knew what they were there for, to listen to the Quran. And they, you know, they obviously were surprised to see each other, and they told each other, you know, we can't do this. This, this is wrong. What would the people think if they found out? So they went home, and and what happened is the next night the same thing happened. You know, they all came thinking that none of, not the, you know, none of them would come either, and the same thing happened. They bumped into to, into each other after they list, after they listened to the Quran, and again they said the same thing that we need to stop doing this, um, but they wouldn't admit why they were there. They all knew why they were there. And the third night, this happened exactly the same thing, until they realized that this is going to cause a fitna for them, and they had to stop doing this, and they made a pact to not do this again. But what this highlights, and this story highlights, is that they themselves, even though they, they were the most ardent enemies of Islam, they tried their utmost to stop others from listening to, to the Qur'an, they couldn't um, stop themselves from listening to the Qur'an themselves. So they would do it in the utmost secrecy in the darkness of the night, uh, the early morning even, um, so that they could listen to the sweetness of the Qur'an. So what it really highlights is that these people, they were experts in the language. They were known to be uh, the most eloquent in Arabic speech, had to concede and had to attest that uh, the speech of uh, the Qur'an was indeed uh, you know, from Allah and beyond the human capability of man. But it was their ego and pride that, that would stop them. And the other thing to really note, you know, this is the miracle of the Quran, and this is the miracle that proves the messengership of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that Islam is the true religion. But the other thing to know is that this miracle um, came for the whole of mankind, because the message of Islam is for the whole of mankind. With the previous prophets and the messengers, their miracles were for the you know that time and place for the people and society uh, that that were that were there then and it was for the people to witness so that they could see and you know have that proof of messengership however however our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has come for all time so that his miracle now needs to be something that all of mankind can witness to and subhanallah sometimes we don't realize but we have 
the access to the miracle of the Quran now, today. And if we hadn't, and if the miracle is purely for uh, you know, the Arabs of Quraysh, then we would not be able to uh, access the miracle. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, decreed that it would be a miracle and the, and the best miracle. As the scholars have said, this is the best miracle because it is something that defies time and space. It doesn't need time and space. It, it um, goes beyond these boundaries. So that's the first thing. The other thing to note is, you know, another thing that the scholars said that made the miracle of Muhammad sallam and his miracle of the Qur'an the best miracle of all the Prophet's miracles was that his miracle was the only one that was the message itself. So what I mean by this is that the previous miracles that came to prove the messengership of other messengers, they were kind of separate to the, the message. You know, they, all their messages were about Tawheed. But their miracles were separate to this and they proved you know, proved the prophethood and messengership. It was nothing not to belittle these. They did they did the job in that they proved beyond doubt that they were messengers of Allah. However, only the miracle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is in itself the message of Islam, you know, the Quran. And this what this is what gives it a, a greater status in in the eyes of many scholars. And they have said this. So now that we know that this is the miracle that proved the messengership of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the second question or the next question we want to ask is, you know, we spoke about that it needs to come with a challenge. Any miracle that the prophets and messengers came with had to come with a challenge, right? So, what is that challenge that this miracle came with? And Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa taala Himself tells us, uh, you know, what that challenge was in the Quran, and this challenge came in three separate stages um, as we know um, you know first Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that you know he commanded the prophets or some to challenge the people to create a book like the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if all mankind and jinn would come together to pro- to produce the like of this Quran they could not produce its like even though they exerted all uh, of their strength in aiding one another so Allah is saying you know produce one book like the Quran and you know you will surely fail even if you came all together to do this so it started off as this you know Allah you know challenged mankind and the Quraysh to produce something like it you know you guys are the experts in language and eloquence of speech if you um, don't believe it that this is truly the message of Allah then produce something like it and oh, surely they failed so Allah then you know made the, made the challenge much easier um, in the next part of the challenge he said okay don't produce a book like it just produce 10 chapters like the Quran uh, even not even better than the Quran, just like the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Am yaquluna iftarahu kul fatu bi ashri suwarin mithlihi muftariyatin wadu man istatatum min dun illahi in kuntum sadiqin." Or do they say that he, Muhammad sallam, has invented it? Say to them, bring ten invented chapters like it, and call for help on whomever you can besides Allah, if you are truthful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, look, if you think that he invented it, then you yourself come and bring some ten, only 10 chapters like the Qur'an and call anyone you wish to, not just by yourself. Ask anyone, the jinn and the mankind, ask them all together to come together to produce something like it, you know, like 10 chapters of the Qur'an and you will fail. And finally, in the, you know, the, it's an embarrassment to the Quraysh that they would not be able to do this, yet they or you know, continue to be against the, the message of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the, the challenge very easy. You know, if, if, if they, easy in the sense that it was simple, yet the people would never be able to match it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the challenge only for mankind and the Quraysh to produce only one chapter like it. And we know that the shortest surah in the Quran is Al-Kawthar, which only consists of three ayat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am yaquluna iftarahu qul fa'atu bi suratim mithlihi wad'u min istata'atum min dhunillahi in kuntum sadiqeen. Or do they say, 
He invented it. Say, then bring forth a surah like it and call upon for assistance whomever you can besides Allah if you are truthful. So Allah, you know, made the challenge very easy for them. Now just produce one chapter like it, one small surah like the Quran. And, you know, this challenge is still, it was never met by the Quraysh. And it, it's something that, um, is you know, yet is, the challenge remains today for mankind to anyone that does not believe in Islam and is against Islam and doesn't believe the Quran to the, be the message and, and word of Allah to produce just a surah like it. And, you know, this proclamation is repeated several times in the Quran. And it was therefore the greatest challenge to the literary expertise of the Quraysh. You know, they were the experts, yet they failed to meet this challenge. And at the same time, it was a stab to their creed and their beliefs. So when the Quraysh realized that they could not meet this challenge, they resorted to calling the Prophet ﷺ other things and, and lying and slandering against the Prophet. You know, they called him insane. They called him a sorcerer, a soothsayer, and even a poet. But the one challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had set them, they were unable to meet. And this challenge, you know, it's been on met since that, you know, the time the Prophet ﷺ was in Arabia and to this day. And no one has a been able to meet this challenge. And even, like I was saying, even the non-Arabs, uh, non-Muslim Arabs uh, themselves um, really, um, you know, they, even though they don't believe in Islam, they do testify to the fact that the Qur'an is greater than normal speech and is beyond the capability of any human being. And, you know, the, the, the enemies of today, they spend their billions in attacking Islam in all aspects of society and all around the world. Um, whether it be through the intellectual attack, whether attacking the ideas of Islam and the Islamic concepts, or their physical attacks on the Ummah with their, with their military might. You know, they are spending billions to attack Islam in their war on Islam. However, they've una been unable to do the one thing that would destroy Islam in an instant. You know, they could hire the best Arab linguists and make an attempt to meet this challenge. But they don't because they know that they'd be they'd fail in doing this. Um, and Allah, as Allah has said, even if they were to bring all of mankind and jinn together, they'd fail in this attempt, attempt. So in conclusion, really to bring the podcast to an end, you know, we've um, established beyond doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, is... Um, the, you know, the Qur'an is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this Qur'an was the proof of the messengership of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that proved he was the final messenger so it's incumbent on us all to have this confidence in Islam and be able to arrive at Islam in this sense in a, in a really intellectual manner um, and obviously to, to, to ensure that we as Muslims can kind of pass it down to our children and other generations and if, even in our da'wah we can um, explain Islam in this uh, simple way and also prove that Islam is the true deen of all the deens. And, you know, when we have established the fact that the Qur'an is a speech of Allah, we accept everything within the Qur'an. So Allah's statements about the, you know, as for us to believe uh, in the angels and the day of judgment and heaven and hell, you know, this is established by the fact that we have now, uh, with confidence, with firm conviction, we believe that the Qur'an is from Allah. So anything in it, we will also believe. And the other thing we should recognize is that, you know, the Qur'an is not just a book that needs to be recited and gather dust uh, in most, most times in the year. We need to recognize that the book of Allah, the Qur'an, is a guidance for mankind. It's a furqan, as Allah has described it to be. So in knowing this and having that confidence that this is the miracle that we can ac access today, uh, we should refer to the Quran and the Sunnah in every matter of our lives and uh, and recognize that this is the only way that we will, we will succeed. And that's exactly what the Sahaba did. Um, so they, whenever a verse was revealed, they looked to enact it and implement it in their lives. And we must also do the same. We have to accept all the laws that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has decreed. Uh, and informed us to um, abide by and we have to stay away from all the prohibitions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also set out for us in his book and implement in the best of manner in our lives um, and where there is an absence of 
any of the laws of Allah or any of the commands of Allah, we need to seek to implement it. Um, whether it be individually where that's possible or through the correct means where, where you know, for example, there's certain societal laws that we are, as individuals can't establish, but as a collective ummah, we need to work in order to do this. And this is exactly what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, um, as we will go through the seerah and understand. So it's this kind of intellectual belief, this strong conviction in, in Islam and, and the fact that they recognize that the Quran was the speech of Allah and the, the, the Messenger وسلم, was indeed the Messenger of Allah. It, gave, it made them this invincible force. It gave them that strength, uh, that they were ready to sacrifice anything that would come in their way, um, purely for the attainment of the pleasure of Allah and, and you know avoidance of his punishment. So this Iman... Um, in the same manner should also in iman in the quran and islam in the same manner should also transform us and it's required the only way that the islamic ummah is going to be salvaged from the situation that we find ourselves in is coming to islam in this manner and understanding that our solutions and, and all uh, you know the answers to our problems can come from the quran and the sunnah and inshallah uh, when we do this, we will find that you know sex, success and victory will come from Allah. So, just to bring the podcast to a close, really, I pray that um, you know I've, you've benefited from it and I've explained things in a clear and concise manner. And obviously, if you have any questions or anything, please do ask. Um, inshallah, I'll try to answer anything. And yeah, Jazakallah Khairan for listening. And you know, please share this episode with others that may benefit. And if you haven't already, and if you're a new listener, please do take the time to listen to some of the previous episodes. Uh, inshallah. Uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are, because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.